Because I've been here a week and I'm still not used to this air. And, uh, I said, yeah, I said the first several months I was there, every time we would sing songs, I was sucking wind and we're a thousand feet lower than what we were there. But anyway, it's good to be back. And uh, my allergies are adjusting back to chalice from Arizona allergies right now. So anyways, all right, Brother Mike, Mike, sorry. You want to lead some prayer to it this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this time to come together and to hear your word preached. Lord, we thank you for this church family and the blessing that they are. Lord, for all you do, we thank you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The morning service for the missions report, I'm going to do a, uh, a little slide, or whatever you call that. It's not slides anymore, but uh, PowerPoint. I don't know what the technical term for it is called. It is slides? <laughs> All right, slideshow, but not like the old days. Remember, we used to get that circle thing and drop the little things in there. And, uh, yeah, and then somebody dropped one in upside down and yeah. it up. And everybody laughed, but uh, not quite like that anymore. But show you what the Lord did down there. It was was really amazing, and uh, <clears throat> really exciting ministries was being able to be part of. Uh, I preached Sunday morning at the church at Ganado where we were staying. That one was, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, Ganado. Ganado Baptist Church. Ganado Baptist Church, okay, that's why. <laughs> nice simple name like Ganado Baptist Church. The other ones have more unique names, and we had seen uh, where the church was being built, the Stronghold Baptist Church in Pinon there. And then there was also a something solid rock, solid rock Baptist church. And where was that one at? Nazalini. And we were actually there the last day as we were leaving town. That's where Brother Joel Haynes lives, is right by that one. So I was trying to keep all those names straight. But I, I tell you what, we sang uh, the first the first night there, Wednesday night. Uh, we probably sang eight or ten songs, all stands. We never sat down. But we'd sing the first verse in Navajo, the second verse in English, the third verse in Try It So, and the fourth verse in English. And Try It So was us trying to sing Navajo. Wow. That is a not easy. I think the only word I got down was hola, and it means heart. And that's because we sang a song that it may have been, was it since Jesus came into my heart? Maybe. I think it was. I think we sang this in Navajo. And uh, so, hola, I'm trying to pronounce it right, it's hard, but just, just a lot of precious people there. You'd go out in the community and you'd see people that probably don't know the Lord. And they're not a rude people, really. They're, they're kind of friendly. They really are. They're kind of friendly, and um, but kind of just lost and undone. It really is, even though it's right there in Arizona, at least where we were at, um, it really is like a foreign land. It's a totally different culture, totally different people. And, uh, but then to see the joy on those people that have been saved and they're in the church, just precious, precious people. I'm not saying this, but they evidently, some places are big on this. To me, it doesn't matter one way or the other, but I probably signed more Bibles Sunday morning than I've signed in my entire 30 years of preaching. And uh, they evidently didn't know better, but uh, <laughs> but just just precious people, a lot of really good testimonies and lives changed and, and different things. And and um, one of the fellows was there a, a lot of the days. Myron was there and, and helping out, but other guys would drop in and ladies would drop in and different things like that. See what was going on and and. Uh, Garbage is a big thing out there. Collecting it, and uh, one guy brought a dump trailer, Chuck. We didn't have a dumpster there. He brought a dump trailer, and he took everything. Everything, and there wasn't a ton of scrap left over, but even where we tore one wall out and put a door in and stuff in the old building, 
He took all that and he'll sort through that and he'll use, he'll save anything that's salvageable and the rest get, get rid of somehow, some way. I don't, I didn't even ask. Burns it. Burns it? Okay. Burns it. And, uh, but, uh, really unique people and, uh, Brother Haynes and his dad, Mark, both of them, uh, <coughs> wonderful people, their wives and, uh, the boys had a good time with, uh, Brother Joel has five boys, and uh, they they spent some time basketballing at the church and basketballing at the house, and uh, just one hoop in both places, just just playing and playing and playing. So I'll talk more about it during the slide thing. One song, one twenty-two, one twenty-two. get into lesson number eight. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 20. Chapter number 20. Look at verse number 35 as we look at this lesson on the exceptional man's giving. <clears throat> I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's interesting there. Paul, we know that the Bible points out to us that Paul was a tent maker by trade. Tent maker before he went into the ministry and a tent maker after God called him into the ministry. And there was often times that that tent making came in handy to meet not only his own needs, but the needs of others. And we look at that and we See, in verse number 33, he said, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. The, uh, some of the Na Navajo people down there are really gifted silversmiths. They do. I really didn't see any, any gold. We went to a uh, flea market on Saturday, Friday, Friday was the 60 mile an hour wind day. Praise the Lord, we had finished sheeting the roof on Thursday. So everything was battened down on Friday. Uh, we worked on some of the interior stuff that needed to be done, the interior walls, and also guys worked on the north end of the north gable end because the wind was coming out of the south-southwest, and it was 
20, the, the forecast said 20 to 40 mile an hour winds with gusts up to 65. And I would venture to say there was quite a few gusts up to 65. I mean, it was just all day long blowing and going. And uh, so on Friday, we finished up that stuff. We were ahead of schedule. And so, uh, and everybody had been working some long days and trying to get adjusted to the altitude and stuff. And, and Brother Randy said, we're going to take the day. And I think, was, was that the day, Colton, they went to the, on Saturday, did they go to the Grand Canyon that day? No, it was Wednesday. They went to the Grand Canyon. Saturday, they went to Gallup. Yeah, they went to Gallup as a group. And we end up seeing them there. Gallup was about an hour away. The closest big town of any size is Gallup, New Mexico. It's an hour away. Um, actually, it was an hour away from where we were staying. It was two hours from where the church was being built. And um, so as we went, the, the weather was really kind of cruddy on, on Saturday. Probably Friday and Saturday, definitely the worst weather we had. But um, Saturday was... Kind of windy, not as bad as the day before, but it was sleeting, big pellets, it was snowing, it was sunshine, and it just kept changing back and forth. And but mostly the 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 sleet and the snow and the wind and stuff like that. So there were some people there at that flea market, a lot of people displaying silver, silver jewelry that they had made. Some of those people are are really talented. Not my taste in jewelry, kind of big, kind of bold. Kind of uh, don't tell them, Gotti, um, you know, but they like it and stuff. And but there, there's no questioning the talent that it takes to do that stuff. And Paul said this. He said, "I've coveted no man's silver, or gold, or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were." with me. He's saying these hands, these hands that I am penning this letter with have also met my needs and also those people that were traveling with me. And, and in verse 35 is the verse we're looking at, and I'm just laying the, the, the background, the groundwork to it there. I have showed you all things how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's interesting, this dynamic happens so often. We went down there to endeavor to be a blessing to that ministry, to those people, to that church, and yet we were on the receiving end of blessing, just getting to know those people, to meet those people. Uh, you'll understand when Brother Joel gets up here for our fall revival. He's a um, he's a very personable man. He's a very positive man. Um, he he's a guy that is sarcastic, and, and and he'll joke and stuff like that. And I I just getting to know him, but I wondered. He, he's very unique in that way, and I wondered where that came from until I met his dad, Mark. And his dad, Mark, is actually more of all of that stuff, especially sarcastic. It's just unbelievable. I met the guy in there in the parking lot at the Bible College. He'd just come out from teaching class 10 o'clock at night. And, I mean, he's just cutting up and, and carrying on. And, and he was telling me, he said, I'm leaving tomorrow. And going back to their sending church in Texas, and they wanted him to teach some classes and some modules. And, and then he goes, and, he, and he, he's telling about all this stuff. He said, I'm preaching on Sunday three or four, I think four times on Sunday with Sunday school. And <clears throat> then I'm teaching these classes Monday through Thursday. And then he wants me to do these other classes in the afternoon. And, and then when I get back, I've got a nervous breakdown scheduled. <laughs> he said, I'm 67 years old. He said, I think they're trying to kill me. And uh, laughing the whole time he was saying all that. And, and I think about that. <clears throat> the type of uh, men that God has called down there to that place. To me, if you didn't have that type of makeup, you probably wouldn't last down there. 
It is just, you almost have to be able to laugh through life because what you see around you. And uh, one of the things that, that they shared was, no matter how long you live on that reservation, you'll never own the dirt that your place is sitting on. You'll never own the ground. You'll never own an acre. And I, and I stopped to think about that a second. I didn't ask him that question. I didn't ask him that question. But can you imagine that? No matter how much you improve the place, one thing we saw out of all the miles we drove, you'd starve to death as a realtor down there. I think we saw one real realtor sign, one for sale sign. In all the miles we drove, one. I think a young married couple that are neighbors there can designate and get possession or use of one acre. Yeah. And usually it's along the road or next to uh, mom and pop or grandma or whatever. Yep. And there'll be a little driveway and there'll be just a string of little houses by it, whatever. Yeah. So that they can have that one acre as kind of a home site. And then if they want to run sheep, they can have a little flock of 30 or 40 sheep and just graze all around. Yeah. But they have to provide the water for those sheep. They might have to haul it in. Yeah. Anyway. Yep. And, and so there's no real fancy houses there. A lot of double wides, a lot of single wides. A lot of these little look they look like they're kits like octagon little shape panelized houses that I guess would be a modern version of a hogan and uh, but stop and think about that no matter how long you live there you're never going to own the dirt that the house sits on you're never going to own your own acreage <clears throat> and for the fellows ministering down there because they're not Navajo, they can't get that property. They can't get a acre to put the house on. They can, however, put it on the church property. And the church, through paperwork and, and paying money and stuff, can get that. And, and so right there in uh, Pinon, there was a, uh, a double-wide sitting there that they're using for uh, Brother Jake and his wife. They're staying there. There's an apartment on the one end. Over there at Naslini, um, there's a double wide that Brother Joel has, but that's an hour from the church he's pastoring. An hour. Can you imagine commuting an hour? Everybody, Brother Lewis knows about commuting an hour, but they're going to move it. They're going to move that place to Pinyon, his double wide. Yeah. That's what their Sunday morning begins with. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> we weren't there at that one for Sunday morning, but we were there at that one for Sunday night at Brother Mark's church. So when you think about that and you think about that dynamic, for, for them to, I'm not saying covetousness doesn't exist, because the surprising thing is in the dynamic that's there, there's a lot of houses that you drove by and you'd say, somebody lives there? Really? But yet, an awful lot of nice vehicles driving around. Yeah. It's like they have more investment in their vehicles, which are a depreciating item, than they do in their houses. Mm -hmm. But when you stop and think about it, no matter how much you fix your property up, you're never going to get any return on what you fix up. It's just all money down the drain. Well, Unless... The federal government owns it. The federal government owns every stitch of land in that reservation. Am I wrong on that, brother? The tribe owns it, but the, the tribe cooperates with the federal government as far as hospitals and schools. Right. And it's, uh, I think it was described as not a sovereign nation. Okay. In other words, I don't think we saw any casinos. No. In any of the towns. Uh-uh. And 
they don't have to obey state laws or federal or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the, I, the federal government helps them a lot on, right. on schools, hospitals, and maybe roads. I, I think actually when it boils down to the fed government is the one that has the land, but they allow the tribe to caretake it basically and feel like they own it. You know, and, and so there's a bunch of, who knows the restrictions, but he said in order to get that one acre for a young married couple, he said it's scads of paperwork and, and thousands of dollars. And then once you get all the ducks in a row and the same with the church, it's even more for the church to get property to sit on, but it's never really theirs. And so Paul, in, in, in this instance here, he's talking about this idea about not coveting. But yet the, the idea when you talk to those people, the ones we were able to talk to, you get the idea they love. Somebody asks, well, why don't they leave? Well, that's home to them. It's all they've known. Right. And they probably consider the reservation belongs to the tribe, and so as they're part of the tribe, it's ours. Yeah. And, and there's safety in that. Even more so than you know, we think of public land here being ours. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. And you're probably right in that assessment, Brother Keith. And so Paul's saying this when when he when he's talking about is he went from place to place, different town, different area, different culture, different community. He's saying this. Really, it's amazing what he says. I coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. And he probably thought, saw a lot of different varieties of that. <clears throat> we went into a pawn shop in Gallup there, and the whole place was just full of mostly... Uh, jewelry and stuff. I can honestly say I coveted none of it. I coveted none of it. wasn't wasn't my taste. wasn't you know. But I place the place was packed with people, packed with people, and people buying and selling and pawning that type of stuff. But but there was some other stuff that I probably would say, yeah, I'd like to have had that. You know. But Paul's like, I didn't have that. But this is, the, this is the, the pattern that he sets for the people. This is the pattern that he sets for us in Scripture here. He says, His hands ministered unto his necessities to them that were with him. And he's, what he's saying there is, I was being a role model, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. When Paul was in the position where he had to fall back into tent making. He wasn't sitting there going, oh man, I'm going to go out and buy myself a new chariot. I'm going to go out and customize my rig. I'm going to go out and get myself some new duds. He was saying, I'm just meeting the needs. I'm just putting food on the table. I'm just paying the bills. And I'm doing that only for me, but those that are along for the ride with me. And he's saying this, we ought to think about this, when the opportunity presents itself to support the weak, we ought to be willing to do that. We ought to be in a giving mode and have that grace in our hearts. Why? Because Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. When I think about the group of guys that came from, from back east and stuff. <coughs> the, the, uh, it was interesting. They, I think they brought three trucks. There, there was a Dodge there. There was a Ford there. And there was a, was a Chevy or GMC? GMC. They had all three brands there. And, and they brought, I think, three, three trailers with them. And, you know, they were coming out to be a blessing. And I tell you what, just getting to meet those fellows and see those fellows, each and every one of them was a, was a blessing to be around. And then the joy of 
the two that we knew for sure on the trip that weren't saved, both those guys got saved. One got saved Friday night, and the other guy got saved Monday night, I think. Yeah, I think it was Friday night and Monday night. What a joy. What a joy. And, and I tell you what, the younger, the grandson, the grandson, boy, what a difference. You could see it, you could see it all over him. He was just a glowing after that point. The other guy, too, but not so much. And I think about what a, what a, what a life-changing trip it was, especially for those two individuals. But it all came about because some people had in their heart to give. They weren't out there looking to take. They were out there looking to give. Generosity is a wonderful character trait. You know, we live in an age of unabashed selfishness. And as we think about that, the greed in our culture, <clears throat> the last day that we were there, there was just tools, tools upon tools upon tools upon tools. And a lot of cordless tools, a lot of Milwaukee, some DeWalt, and... Um, the last day, batteries had gotten switched and shuffled, and, and, and we spent probably about 20 minutes, about three of us the last day, spent about 20 minutes trying to sort out whose batteries were where. And I think, I think when it was all said and done, we figured out all the different batteries. But you know what? That's just because they were getting packing up, getting ready to, to head home. Never during the week did somebody say, hey, are you using my battery? No, it was share and share alike. But when we, we got ready to finish up and we were just cleaning everything up, everybody sorted out. In fact, I think even if there was a couple that nobody knew for sure who they were, but the owner finally came forward and claimed them. <coughs> but there was none of that on the project at all. And even, even as, we, as, as we sorted out, people were just laughing and joking about it and and in some of those batteries, I'm sure, were $150 a piece because they were 8 or 10 amp hours. They were enormous batteries. But what a contrast that is to the dog-eat-dog -dog mentality that our society is consumed with today. Men with a giving heart are refreshing inspiration. It was interesting. You'll see a picture. I'm pretty sure I know we took them. And uh, there was a Randy there, and there was a Mike there. And they were the two builders that were, they, they both had construction businesses. And two different, two entirely different personalities. But yet the whole week or the whole week and a half we were working just seamlessly together. And as, as, as it went back and forth, both those guys were, were guys that if you had a question, you could go ask one or the other. If I went to Mike, Randy didn't get offended. If I went to Randy, Mike didn't get offended. But yet, we all knew at the end of the day, Randy was the one that was running everything. He was, that was, that was where the buck stopped, was with Randy. And, but yet, there was never, never a squabble between the two of them. And why? Because they both had said, this is for the glory of God. This isn't for the glory of, of Mike. This is not for the glory of Randy. This is not for the glory of any of them, any of us. This is for God's glory. We're going to set ourselves aside. We're going to check our egos at the door. What a refreshing mindset to be around. A person who is not obsessed with who they are and what they have, who is instead willing to invest in somebody else, is a unique individual today. <clears throat> I think the guy that 
uh, I don't know how old he was, probably I'm guessing mid-30s. He, he taught the class that Nehemiah was in and uh, saved there in the ministry and brought up and trained and mentored and using his calling and ability to do just a joy, just a joy. He's the assistant at the one church. And while we were there, we also met another fellow who had just come on board there like a month ago, and, and he's at the very beginning stages of that. And I'm sure, I'm sure if we were to see him, you know, two or three years down the road after being mentored by Brother Joel, he'll be a totally different individual than what he is now. And uh, Brother Joel even, even said a couple things like, yeah, he's young, he's new, he'll get it, you know? And, and I think about it, but... I'm sitting there going, wow, with everything Brother Joel's got going on. And, yeah, I, I can't even begin to wrap my brain around everything he's got going on. Maybe he doesn't even have his brain wrapped around everything that's going on. But yet through that all, the willingness to invest in people. And uh, what is that? That's the opposite of selfishness. He makes some notes here in the lesson. Selfishness comes in many disguises. Ever have your wife ask you for help in the kitchen? And you like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Well, if you don't go help her, it's selfish. You ever your child bring a bro something broken to you? Come with their bicycle, they come with this, that toy. Why are they doing that? They're needing help. And that's that's one of those things because maybe maybe they don't understand. We're preoccupied with and, and back in the day. Back in the day, years ago, remember the old black and white shows where dad would come home and, and mom was making dinner and he'd sit there and read the evening newspaper and be preoccupied with the evening newspaper? Well, we don't have to think very far, but understand this, this has taken the place of the evening newspaper. This is worse than the evening newspaper ever thought of being. But sometimes we get wrapped up in this world and we're selfish when we shouldn't be. Something needs done around the church, some task. Is your default setting to find an excuse to avoid it? Paul talks about when we see a brother that have need and we shut up our bowels of compassion. On the way out, we stopped. It was right on the, on the way. We'd swung by Joel's house to pick up uh, Nehemiah's sweatshirt. And it was a road that paralleled the, the highway that we had traveled several times uh, to get to uh, Pinion. <coughs> and we, there everybody was saying, you need to go to Canyon de Shea. And um, the... Uh, was just right north. We'd actually passed it on the way in, didn't realize it, and was right on the way on the way out. So we went out there, and um, we went to the south side, the south rim of it, and, and we drove by the place, some places that you could look, and we were going to go out all the way to the end of Spider Rock and then work our way back. Well, we had saw, the, the, to me, the end of it, in my mind, I thought the end of it was the better part. And, and so we went all the way down to, to Spider Rock, Sliding House of Spider Rock. We saw what there was to see there, spent a decent amount of time there, and we were working our way back. 
and we had seen a lot of, a lot of beauty. And uh, I made the comment, I said, do you guys want to stop at some of those other places or have you seen enough hole in the ground? And uh, it's kind of mixed, mixed feedback. And as we were coming back, there was a spot there, I think it was called the Junction, was the one. And then I can't remember what the second one was, but literally it was, they were just, the parking lot was just right off the road. So it wasn't like you had to drive a mile or two to get to the sightseeing place, or I think we probably drove three miles at the one. It was just right there. So we pulled off the first one, we saw some things. And then the very last one we pulled off there, and uh, there was a lady there, she had a little table set up and she was selling things. And my wife and kids stopped for a minute and then they walked over to, to look at the sites. And I was talking to the lady, she had this pottery there, these bowls with like a hole in the top. They, she said they used to dry seeds in them years ago, but now they're pretty much just decorations. All, all done out of clay, all painted beautifully and carved. Once again, not my taste, but the craftsmanship that went into it, just beautiful, meticulous. And uh, <clears throat> so I was talking to her about that. Well, she told me right before, I, she said, well, there's some ruins to the left when you're over there, and there's some ruins to the right. And also right there, there was a herd of sheep and some sheep dogs. It's kind of neat. Glad we stopped. So... We went, we looked, and, and Colton, Colton spotted some of the ruins, both, both directions, got, took some photographs of them. And so we're on our way out, and I, I had stopped, and I bought my wife a bracelet. She had these bracelets that were, oh, I can't remember, juniper berries. Juniper berries and um, like turquoise or something like that. Really reasonable, like 10 bucks. I don't even know how you make the thing for 10 bucks. And it was all, it wasn't like plastic beads. I mean, it was stuff that somebody took some time to drill holes in. And uh, so while I was finishing that transaction, this guy walked up, kind of a bedraggled looking fellow, and he had a backpack and he started pulling these uh, pieces of, I don't know what it was, slate, something with like paintings and the craftsmanship really wasn't there, and there was nothing about it that said, oh, I'd like to hang that on my wall. But to some people, maybe, it was more, I don't know, abstract art, I guess you'd call it. But it was interesting, because he asked me if I was interested. I said, no, no, thanks, sorry. <clears throat> and he said this. I mean, this guy looked rough. He said, sir, could I have some water? You know what? You know what popped in my head immediately? That verse about Jesus, where he says, "You give a drink of water in my name." Immediately, before I could even answer the guy, that verse, the Holy Spirit brought that passage of scripture to my mind and said, "This is an opportunity." So I went to the cooler, I went to the camper, I looked at a couple of different places. I finally found what was left of a big gallon of water that we had poured drinks out of, and there was like that much left. Because the other bottles had already been opened, and we'd already drank out of those small bottles. I didn't want to give them, hey, we swigged out of this, but you can have it. You know? So I gave him this. I said, hey, we just poured out of this, and I gave him a couple of things, a, a couple of small packages of cheese, and I gave him a track. Who knows what will come of that someday? But I'm... I'm not saying this on God is my witness. I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back because when he initially asked me for the drink of water, you know what my default setting was? What are you trying to do? What are you getting at? Just because of his looks, his appearance, I immediately went on guard. I mean, long, scraggly hair looked like he hadn't taken a shower in a month. I mean, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying that's the way he looked. And just a second, Keith. But my immediate def default setting was be careful. Be careful. And then the Holy Spirit threw that verse at me. And I'm like, okay, I'll go get him some water. Yeah. 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 
on it. Yeah. And, 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 and you're so right in all of that. But my initial reaction was I had just dealt with this really pleasant lady, super helpful, and this guy that definitely didn't look like any of us walks up, and, and my, my guard went up. My guard went up. And then the, then the Lord, Spirit, Lord, the Spirit of God threw that verse at me. And it's like, yeah, you're right. Let's go find him some water. And honestly, by the time I got back from the camper, I was wishing I had a whole gallon to give him. I really did. But you know what? I, I give that illustration just because, and hadn't planned on giving that illustration, just because of how the Bible talks about when you see somebody have need and you shut up your bowels of compassion. <clears throat> you understand everybody we encounter has a need of some sort. Even the rich people that we sometimes see roll in and they got some fancy high-end, you know, $80,000, $120,000 car. We, we saw somebody, I can't remember what town it was in, probably Salt Lake. What was that fancy sports car we saw yesterday? Lamborghini? That green Lamborghini? Somebody went by in a neon, lean, neon green Lamborghini in Salt Lake. You know, probably, who knows, $200,000, $250,000 car. I don't know what they cost. But I understand something. The driver of that car had needs. A man looked at him on the, on the outside and said, he's driving a Lambo. He's driving a car that's worth more than my house. How could he have needs? Well, probably for certain, if he's not saved, he has a need of Christ. You know, Brother Keith. Oh, probably more than my mortgage. You know? Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm saying is you, 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 you and our, 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 our fleshly setting is that default setting of be careful. You don't want to be taken advantage of. Be careful. Is that guy going to try to steal your wallet? Why is he asking you for a drink of water? Is he going to scalp you? You know, I'm just being silly about that. All right? No, the guy was thirsty, saw we had a camper sitting there, figured we probably had some water somewhere, somehow, and just simply asked me for a drink of water. Don't shut up our bowels of compassion. God is not so much interested in how much a man gives as he is what he has left over. <clears throat> Sometimes we get so preoccupied with the amount that we're giving that we lose scope of what we are keeping. You know, Jesus was more impressed by the widow's two mites because she was giving everything she had. The rich guys came in and threw in big, big amounts, but they walked away with bigger amounts in their bank account, in their mattress, wherever they had it stored. You're saved in here this morning, you've been bought with a price. Think about that. Think of how priceless the blood of Jesus Christ is. What, what can be substituted for the blood of Jesus Christ? Nothing. Nothing. No matter how rare the artifact is, no matter how valuable it may be, There is nothing that is even close to being at the same level as the price that we were bought with. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, let's go ahead and turn there. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 20.
Bible says, for you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, we can look right on the outside and have the wrong spirit on the inside. The flip side of that is we can be right on the inside and not be so right on the outside. And God says we need to cover both the bases. Glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. There are two basic attitudes towards giving. One outlook is that a man is being billed by God for something he owns. The other attitude is that the man is in love with God and wants to show it every chance he gets. We should have that second attitude. We've been given so much. Like I said, some of the houses down there, some of the accommodations down there that those people live in and exist in, you just can't fathom it. You can't fathom it. When I think about that. And understand something. This is in our country. I saw no mansions on the reservation. I saw some mansions in Salt Lake, but I saw none on the reservation. And you know, we can have that attitude of, well, I'm going to give because I have to. Because I have to. Or, I'm going to give because I love to. The Bible says, God loveth a cheerful giver. God loveth a cheerful giver. Here's something that jumped out, out to me. <clears throat> Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we were at um, the church there in Pinon, which I don't think, I think it's the m most recent church plant there. If not, it's one of the most recent. And it's in Pinon is a rough town. And, uh, but yet, I'm pretty sure it was at that bulletin I looked at their faith promise pledge for the year. And here's this church. Probably less than five years old. I think he said Sunday morning there was 95 there. Sunday morning. Sunday night there was probably 60 plus on Sunday night, I'm guessing. But... Here these people are, they're not living in luxury, they're not rolling in dough, there's not high paying jobs. He said a plumber, Tony, plumber. If a plumber can find a job, he's going to be more than likely working for one of the chapter houses and it's a two month contract. No matter how much experience he has, two month contract, 10 bucks an hour. $10 an hour. And they're thrilled if they get that two-month contract. And, and so a lot of the jobs are along those lines, but yet their faith promise for the pledge for the years was, was probably 10000 over ours. And I'm not saying that to, to, to put them on a pedestal. I'm not saying that to be critical I'm saying it to illustrate this. There's something in their heart that they want to give. There's something in their heart that they want to give, even though if we looked at their tax returns at the end of the year, probably the average that they make is far below what any of us make. We were there when uh, the United Church was having their uh, first 
A Ganado. Yeah. At Pinon, I think it was 46, what was in the bulletin. 90 at, at Ganado. Yeah. He was saying a lot of them were working two or three jobs just, you know, to exist and to make ends meet and stuff like that. So it's interesting, we hear we arrive at this, and I, I, I had no idea the, the lessons that God would teach on this trip that would line up with the lesson that he had for us in this book. But God did. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, we thank you for...